Hello and welcome to another episode of India Risk Report and in this episode we are looking at road safety and infrastructure related issues and its impact on the corporates, the employees, the individuals and their families. More so because road accidents take many many more lives at least of Indians than we have lost in all our wars since independence and equally importantly 12 lakh people die in the world each year because of road accidents and impacting something close to 3% of the GDP of most important countries in the world. India accounts for 10% of global road accidents and more specifically overall road crashes could cost the world up to 518 billion dollars each year and uh, to put uh, a yardstick to that that is at least more than twice the GDP of Pakistan annually. So you can imagine uh, the sheer size of impact that road accidents and hazards are causing to the global economy. Equally important is the fact that bulk of the road accidents are happening because either infrastructure is bad, roads are poorly designed or individuals are not following the basic rules of safety that must be followed in today's world when vehicles are fast and often unmanageable if you make one short and small mistake. We have a panel of three experts who are going to enlighten us today about issues related with road safety and what we can do in India, particularly because out of all the international standards, India has been able to adhere to only one, and that is the imposition of seat belts in cars. Most other safety standards are not yet implemented in India as per international norms. And we have the experts here with us who are going to educate us more where India should be improving uh, very rapidly if we are going to use all the fast vehicles that are coming into the Indian market. We have Mr. N.K. Sinha, who is a former ex-chairperson of the International Roads Federation India chapter. Welcome on the show, sir. Dr. Nishi Mittal, a road safety expert. Welcome, ma'am. And we have Colonel Sharad Bhargav of Allied Solutions, who is a military man and now in the corporate world and has obviously uh, picked up a lot of experience. But I'll come to uh, Mr. N.K. Sinha, sir. Sinha, sir, uh, there is talk that there are some new safety rules and regulations that are going to be implemented through a safety bill. Now, firstly, we know that endless debates and stalling of parliament and not working of parliament to even bear acceptable limits, this bill may take ages to come through. So are we going to wait for the bills to come through to improve road safety or are there some other things that you have in mind that can be quickly implemented by a road safety campaign across the country? Yeah, I mean definitely we are waiting for the bill but with, without that also efforts are being made by, by every person concerned including the government that how the safety can be improved and one of them is the all the design method methodology of roads have been improved considering the factors various factors including uh, the pedestrians uh, the um, mot motorcyclists all those things have been taken into account to design the road properly now that will take time so without that there is a uh, uh, without that we are also trying to have better enforcement better education and awareness those campaigns are going on even on tv also it has been coming there are films depicting the uh, violations traffic violations and how to avoid traffic accidents those are going on so efforts are being made by all the people including the ngos to carry out the massive the massive program for road safety on our roads and to reduce the accident as much as possible uh, Dr. Mittal, uh, one of the things which has worked well in almost all areas is the use of technology to overcome the short form or the shortage of manpower to enforce stringently the measures that are needed. We've always had a very lax attitude to policemen on the road, road safety measures. I mean, every other day you see somebody, some taxi driver, some truck driver, uh, just breaking the rules and 
hoping like hell he doesn't get caught. And youngsters who are now driving like maniacs on the road are a bigger nuisance than even taxi drivers. In Delhi itself, about 15,000 people are caught violating traffic rules. These figures fairly outnumber by 25% or more of the total number of policemen that can be put on the road to enforce traffic rules. Now, they say IT applications can help them overcome that. Do you really feel that technology can work as efficiently here as it does in the Western world or even in some of the Middle Eastern countries or Southeast Asian countries where if you break a traffic rule, then I think you can probably forget about driving at least for a year. You have rightly said the technology is a is an aid to the traffic policeman, not a substitute to it. So technology helps in you know curbing the traffic violations because the people who deny that they did the violation, they cannot deny because it's a proof. But you know you have to see how much this technology is capable of. And once you put the CCTV cameras, I mean the road safety committee appointed by the Supreme Court, and you know we had asked all the uh, state governments that if you put the CCTV cameras on your intersections, do you ever look to the footage? Do you analyze the things? If that is not made use of, then technology will not help. Of course, people are not uh, now started uh, doing that also. Plus, when you catch a violator, what action you can take. Nowadays, as in the Motor Vehicle Act also, there are views that uh, penalties should go up. But if you know, you just increase the penalty without, you know, in the already in the mo old Motor Vehicle Act, the provisions are the, there that if you over speed, your license can be suspended for three months. If you drink and drive, you can be put behind the bars. And you know, the, there are norms, but who get them implemented? We are, have shortage of manpower, we have shortage of equipment. So to get the authentic proof and what action, they, in most of the states, they send it to the courts. And in there, they lie there, no, nothing is happening. So the cost of doing violation is less as compared to benefits derived out of doing the violation. Very, very rightly said, ma'am. In fact, I have a very stern view about all this. And I think the laws in India generally are rather accommodative and compassionate towards individuals. For instance, I mean, if you are fined for over speeding, you probably get charged 500 rupees or whatever, or maybe a little more. I believe if you break a traffic rule, 10% of the value of the vehicle you are driving should be paid by you before you hand, get back the vehicle handed over to you from the police. <laughs> then the pinch will be much harder. No, but if your driving no, no, license but the, the is fact is that suspended? if you are a cyclist, then hmm? your value is of the cycle of a few hmm. hundred rupees yeah. and you pay 10% of that. You are driving a very fancy car which is 50 lakh upwards. When you have to pay 10% of that, believe me, you will start behaving. You know, we have to, be, unfortunately, what happens is that you go in, a bail is given with no disrespect to our honorable courts, but bail is given, you come out, you pay 5,000 rupees, which is the cost of a dinner for that youngster who will go out again and break, break that so rule. That but uh, I, unfortunately, I have, a, I have very little patience for, you know, the whole legal cycle taking place and there are people who walk around proudly in gatherings and say, oh, you know, I've got X number of chalans and X number of cases against me. How does it matter? I'll have another more and I'll take care of it. But I'll come to you, Colonel Bhargav. Corporates, and you deal with them. What is it that is the most worrying aspect to the corporates? We know the corporates have gone into this pool car system. They've gone into getting buses for employees. And I think those buses and the pool cars are by and large not too bad unless some years ago, I used to see in the outskirts of Delhi, the call center culture, where all these, uh, you know, SUV and uh, Innovas and others were loaded with people and every evening going back home. Uh, that was better than trying to stand on the roadside at night and trying to get a bus or a vehicle. So companies used to pick them up and drop them. And the more turns you did, the corporates paid you more. So the drivers were driving recklessly, 
to do one extra round in that 8 hour period at night where they will make another extra round of bucks. So, there is that one set of faults, but the, I think the bigger damage to the corporate is to lose employees who may be extremely bright and capable, but who have a very cavalier attitude to life that I am you know, a very successful banker and therefore I bought this very expensive car and you look at me how I speed in and out of office and speed on the road and one day you die and then the financial liabilities kick in much bigger. So largely uh, the biggest worry of corporates in this kind of scenario is the people itself because the entire delivery is revolving around the people. Losing a person whether he is dying or even if he is off because of a, a serious injury, it really is impacting the organization. It not only impacts the organization, it is uh, you know a, per a family has lost a breadwinner there are people working in the organization around that person, they are feeling impacted. Over and above that is the organizational reputation which is at stake. Because any incident of this nature, it is impacting the entire ecosystem. So, it, it is not only that particular individual and that particular business or that unit, it is impact, impacting I think a large, large number of people and that is what is more worrying. And the organizations have gone uh, out of the way to drive that kind of an education, that kind of a sense of responsibility among the employees and not, not only the employees, it, it is uh, in fact across the spectrum. Anybody who is engaged in the organization, be it on the vehicle drivers for that matter or the employees, everybody is being addressed to ensure that whatever they are doing, they are not violating laws and the rules. Okay, so that's very, very crisply and very comprehensively brought out. We need to go in for a break and we'll come back after a break to look at A, what could be the best global practices that India could adopt and could be successfully implemented in India considering the size and the wide variety of people who've now taken to the roads and the size of the country. I mean, quite clearly, we are a continent, we're not just a country. And equally important is the fact that what other measures can be taken to educate and enhance awareness about road safety uh, before it is too late and you are sorry about something you cannot reverse, but that after break. Welcome back. We are looking at road safety and the hazards that we are facing all over the world, including in India, and what could be the best measures, what could be the best practices that could be implemented in India, and how it could impact on the business of corporates and their profits and the well-being of their employees. And Mr. Sinha, sir, uh, what could you briefly put? could be the best global practices that could be most successfully implemented in India. The seat belt came into being sometime in mid 90s, but after that we have not, we missed the boat on all other things. I would say the, the equipment or uh, ITS measures, that will be one thing which should be implemented at a very fast rate and at a very height, great height. Say for example, you mentioned about penalties being recorded. Not recorded. The chalan goes to the person concerned and it automatically gets in cash from his account. Very good. That should be the criteria and for that you can even employ private persons. I mean right. this need not be police. Right. This need not be police. Right. So those kind of things have to come and that will spread all over the country. If we can we are not only looking after the cities we have to look, look across the country. So that is the major thing which should come here. Chalans, has been, what more than other no, than Chalans? other thi all, all those things, whatever traffic violations are there, they are all carried. Even the, the, uh, the um, uh, kind of breath analyzer. See, now there are cars which will not start if you are drunk. We are, we are a bit far from that. Yeah, I mean, I am just saying that these technologies must come. So technology will help us to guide us how the safety can be improved. But sir, just to take that forward, uh, do you think you have narrowed your vision down to the well-to-do guys who drive cars which are 40 lakh upwards where all this technology comes into being? What happens with the truck driver? Only thing that works is his brake and his gears. No, Tr truck driver also, 
see the question is that driving license is the first one which you mentioned slightly that all these driving license they are never tested the presently now these are all automatic i mentioned technology all automatic plus you know in other countries say switzerland i was i was once i thought that uh, what they are doing that all the drivers i mean the uh, the incumbent driving license hold uh, persons they have to sit in the hospital with the person who is uh, who has met an, with an accident for almost 2 hours before he can be given license he has passed all the tests but he has to sit with that accident person just to imagine what is the impact of accident okay so, uh, so well you yeah, know, i mean here humanitarian also people, here also the police calls you to the police station and puts you through a 2 3 hour exercise by showing you a film that you know you've done this fault and this is how is good driving practices but mostly people send their drivers you know <laughs> so at the end of the day yeah, the, is, the, the, the defaulters because they are wealthy they are always above the law but uh, that is a separate debate altogether Ma dr mithil uh, there are four reasons for a high number of road crash fatalities in india which could be bad road behavior flawed road designing and engineering weak enforcement of traffic laws and lack of rapid trauma care uh, do you think be between these four we are covering most of the key areas and are there any of these areas that you can actually improve other than uh, driving behavior bad road driving behavior which is really the cause of uh, bulk of the accidents you have rightly said these four is they are the and that's why you know we are looking at from uh, all the angles in our that's why supreme court asked us to look at from all the angles mm. and we are covering each and every mm. for as far as engineering is concerned mm. bad roads mm. there and the global practice you just mentioned the best international practice is to have road safety audit mm. road safety audit if it is done at the design stage mm. when the roads are now we are having massive highway development programs mm. four laning six laning then you know you have to but what is happening in india they road safety audits are done but only at the you know for making reports and all the audit recommendations don't get implemented fully on the ground because on the design stage and uh, you neglect the very basic needs of the vulnerable road users like pedestrians cyclists so generally it is these group who are getting killed on the highways and uh, other state highways national highways so you don't look at the your prime focus is on car mm. pcu mm. how fast your vehicle can move car mm. can move but not to the vulnerable road users pedestrian footpath cycle tracks and uh, providing at grade uh, crossing facilities to the pedestrians you provide only the underpasses overpasses which are very difficult for the pedestrians to climb down or climb up so you must as far as possible our designs say uh, norms say that as far as possible you should provide at grade crossing facilities to the pedestrians you can give underpass to the motorist or overpass to the motorist but pedestrians who is already at risk and second uh, very important thing which can be uh, adopted and which we are adopting also somewhat is the traffic calming techniques that is speed over speeding why we are allowing so many so much high speeds mm. on in our network mm. when our roads are not capable of coping mm. with the you know the speed differential the same pedestrian who has a, who has got a speed of 8 to 10 kilometers he shares the same road space with the motorist who drives at 100 to 120 so, kilometers so would i be out of context to suggest just like some years ago there was this big drive to ban big suvs which were diesel consuming because they were impacting the atmosphere now atmosphere to kya hoga 10 saal baad aapki saans kharab hogi nahi you don't know but road accident is instant is instant so can't there be a rule to ban cars which have either have to have a speed controller put into it or they cannot be cars which could go beyond a particular speed limit not by putting it on the road speed limit is there and aap chalte raho till you get caught otherwise you keep speeding but actually 
that you don't allow such cars to come into the Indian market. Again, it is an enforcement, but I say that in engineering, we have got uh, measures which, you know, physically, if you put on the ro uh, roads, on the road itself, the, your speed is, driver is compelled to slow down, like, you know, rumble strips, or, you know, he has to slow down. India mm -hmm. This is a so what you have to do because they won't understand road sign, they won't understand marking, how many understand all these things. So you have to at the strategic locations where there is more, you know, uh, mix of pedestrians and non motorized with the motorized. Say like near schools, hospitals. Yeah, but we also uh, have to be careful not to put unmarked speed breakers because you're suddenly coming zipping is, on a road, that's right. and that's an unmarked speed breaker is equally dangerous to the motorist because there's no dangerous. fault of his. Much more dangerous. I say the correct design. Okay. That's why I'm focusing on road safety audit, which can be done at the for the existing roads also. Okay. So, okay. So hmm. right. So very good points brought up by you, ma'am, uh, uh, Mr. Bhargav. Uh, now. Uh, what do you think should be the enforceable norms by corporates for the transporting agencies which bring employees every day to work and take them back, whether they are taxis or minibuses or whatever? You know, uh, it's not just enough to tell your admin officer, go and hire X number of taxis and he gets the taxi wellers who could be yours today and who could be somebody else's tomorrow. But there must be other than them having yellow number plates and white cars with blue stripes on them, there must be more norms that are enforceable. Let me give you an example. London's taxi driver's A to Z quiz of streets is probably the toughest quiz test in the world. Our taxi drivers should be put through not just a street test, which would be very difficult to implement in India, but at least basic proof that they have been through a very rigid testing system to come to the stage to offer you a taxi. Absolutely. So, uh, I think uh, I will uh, take it in two we have parts. To keep it quick. Absolutely. One is that uh, while we are talking about the enforcement part of it, I think we need to uh, educate right from the childhood to bring up people with that kind of a discipline in mind that they need, they should not be violating uh, traffic norms the way they are driving, the way they are behaving on the roads. That is one part of it. Second is when we are talking about the drivers in our ecosystem, what they are driving and bringing our colleagues, we have to have certain very strict norms. One is that we need to ensure that these vehicle drivers have passed a certain level of tests. Earlier, there used to be a commercial driving license, which has recently been discontinued in, uh, by the uh, uh, discussion which had happened in the parliament. Otherwise, uh, every uh, six months or one year, the, as per the periodicity of that commercial license, they had to get renewed. And they had to go to the RTO to get that thing and to it done. And the training of these drivers has to be on the defensive training. That is something which has to be structured. And that is one area where there is a scope for the government and the private co corporate sector to partner and implement those uh, measures, basically to bring that, that entire population into the folds and to make sure that these people are driving safe on the roads. So that part, yes, definitely corporate can do it. So I'm coming now uh, based on a lot of information that you all have already brought across uh, to really look at your final views on certain areas. One of the questions that is doing the rounds is the fact that uh, do we need to expand road building services to private organization or in a PPP kind of project model where uh, some amount of efficiency and accuracy in doing away with blind spots and other things come into play. Because if you make it a monopoly of only one governmental organization, whether it's the NHAI or whatever, uh, then uh, it would take ages and another five, ten years down the line, there'll be again so many more cars and vehicles on the road that you have not overcome the problems today, how are you going to overcome the next set of problems? One, as you said right, PPP mode is already going on uh, in road construction and that to some extent rather I would say to major extent it is responsible also for the fast rate of development of roads. The one thing is only required is that responsible concessionaires and responsible people to construct the roads 
as Ms. Uh, Mittal also mentioned, that it should be properly designed, well, uh, well documented, uh, this uh, road safety audit and implemented properly. That should be the norm which should be implemented. The other, other point should be that we have to somehow at any point of time we have to divert traffic to public services, public buses. If you, you can't have this kind of population going on single, uh, I mean single occupancy cars, you have to go for public transport. And you see major, major world uh, capitals, they prohibit car in the CBD area, many places. So that situation will come and since we have got lot of these uh, cities, major cities in the country. So those cities will have to observe that CBD area where only public transport can go. All private transport cannot reach there because that is so much number. You have seen the growth of these uh, transport vehicles. Well, you know, you're talking of public transport sir, and you're talking of there is that one challenge that Again, by the time a good public transport is made available, so much more explosion of population and people has happened. Because one of the things is that, you know, I people are predicting that in another 10 years, there will be more of India in urban India than in rural India. So everyone is shifting into the cities. But one of the problems that I find that is also coming up, and ma'am, I'd like your uh, uh, views on that, that in India, state and national highways comprise less than 5% of the roads, but account for 80% of the traffic. So how do you then deal with that aspect? There is Our debate is largely around cities and metropolitan areas, but there is you know, the endless stream of traffic that is going all over the country, and some of these so-called highways uh, are just two lanes. Uh, there are, and they've got villages on either side. People are wanting to cross over. Is their daily business to go from one end to another dukan on the other side and come back with the shopping on this side or whatever else. So how do we, I mean, you cannot suddenly build a road through a habitated village or a township and say, this is the alignment of the national highway that's going. So we are going through from here and you've lived here for centuries, but it doesn't matter. Now you adopt to our norms. How do we come to terms with that? Actually, when we, as I said, you when do the you do the road safety audit, then you know you do uh, d make design drawings. You visit to the areas and you see how much it is affecting the rural life or urban life. And if you know the habitation is more habitation is on the other side, and if they are clustered together, so at the design stage on a piece of paper, we have to plan in such a way that your habitation and uh, this thing they remain on one side and they n need not have to cross so the uh, you know the that probability or that uh, need is reduced second if you can't do that then you have to provide you know the, uh, the crossing facilities which are uh, road user friendly not you know you can provide that Actually, what is uh, in the IRC norm, it is there that after two kilometer, you have to provide some underpass or overpass. But if you uh, draw the drawings in uh, closed rooms and don't go to the actual sites, don't match your drawings with the actual sites in which you have to construct the roads, then you will make the faulty designs. So you have to match your drawings with the actual habitation and make changes. Even if in two kilometers, you have to make two or three underpasses, and at 10 kilometers where there is no habitation, don't provide any underpass or overpass. So it should be need-based planning. You know, where the people, uh, you know, you, that kind of uh, audit has to be done, plus it has to be implemented. My worry is that India is on the stage that they are doing the audit. Every st we have made it compulsory, our committee has asked. But they are not getting the audit recommendations implemented on the ground. So we are after them, that uh, Supreme Court has given directions to them also to adopt this uh, road safety audit uh, things and make the engineers aware. So training of the practicing engineers and highway planners is a must. So, okay, so yeah. obviously, I mean, what you're saying is a lot of sense. I mean, I might just throw in a lighter anecdote. 
you know, the partition of India was done by a British barrister called Cyril Ratcliffe. And because he developed a Delhi belly, he didn't step out of Delhi to look at the ground realities in India That's and drew the lines based on census maps. And we are still suffering uh, <laughs> the confusion that followed yes. uh, the, what he did for mm. the partition of India. But on a more serious note, Colonel Bhargav, uh, India has spent about $20 billion every year for the last several years due to lack of road safety because it comes as an impact on various levels, okay. right? Could you give an estimate that rough from the top of your head that how do corporates look at road safety related hazards and expenses that eat into their annual budgetary outlay? Because is there some miscellaneous amount kept, kept aside? Is there some surprise expenditure that you'll have to cater for? Or do you pass the hat around when somebody dies? I think this is uh, one aspect uh, which uh, uh, no corporate possibly would even look at. The way uh, any government organization, they always have those MACD kind of a budget <coughs> which is al always built in. Uh, those kind of uh, budgetary allocations or that kind of a financial these things. But because this is a recurring phenomenon, it is not a one-time figure I'm quoting. It's happening almost every year on this scale. But the, uh, these uh, are sporadic incidents spread across different industries, different sectors, different organizations. So practically, it would be very, very difficult to quantify that kind of a thing uh, in the terms of which organization incurred what kind of a monetary... No, I'm not saying that. Do they keep a pool of money to basically help out an individual who may be a victim of that kind of an attack, the guy who's your housekeeping boy is crossing the road and he's been knocked over, his family, he's the only source of income. I will, I'll give an example. Every, every colleague working in the uh, uh, corporate, right from the housekeeping to the uh, whosoever is there in the organization, they are well covered from the insurance sector, insurance part of it. So from the monetary point of view, yes, that definitely takes care of. I'll give a live example as to what happened. There was an incident where a driver got he lost his life because of an incident. He was trying to save the colleague sitting in the vehicle and then uh, he died. But that act of his, which saved three more lives, had a I deep impact I assume the colleagues the, would have co uh, they, they, uh, contributed. People were, you know, apart from whatever the government gave, the insurance covered came, people wanted to contribute outrightly, you know. So those kind of activities, does, uh, they do happen. But yes, from insurance point of view, from monetary standpoint of view, yes, organizations, they cover their employees in the organization. So uh, covering them by insurance and covering your employees by insurance is something that uh, is, is a done thing. Uh, soon, the info if the insurance people are watching and they get wind of the kind of figures that are involved, maybe the cost of insurance would soon go up of people who are likely to become victims of uh, such accidents. But there are quite clearly very, very important issues these issues need to be debated much more extensively uh, by us all. Uh, whatever the level of caution that you sound to your near and dear ones, unfortunately, we still hear uh, suddenly the bad news of somebody who's become victim of that. More often than not, these cases are of reckless and bad driving. And equally important is the fact that we have now vehicles on our roads which our roads are not able to provide the space to do the kind of speeding that people are encouraged to do by that. But thank you very much for being with us on this show. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye.